All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. This is our second session uh, with Tim Eastman and friends uh, discussing Tim's new book, Untying the Gordian Knot, Process, Reality, and Context. Thank you for returning. Uh, those of you who were present at the first session, I'm glad you're back. Uh, we were just beginning, obviously, and um, there's so much uh, rich dialogue and discussion that we will really dig into today and in future sessions. Uh, again, the second Saturday, uh, once per month through January of 2022. So we are really just getting started here. Um, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Cobb Institute and the Science Advisory Committee. We are um, engaging in on a couple of different fronts to further the mission of, of the Institute as a whole, and, and uh, in particular, um, building a network of Whitehead-inspired or process-inspired scientists so that we can have more dialogues like this, conferences in the future. Uh, we have some um, recorded uh, interviews with Whitehead uh, influence scientists that are up on our website. Uh, I won't say more about that today. I want to leave as much time as possible for discussion. Um, Dr. Timothy Eastman, um, plasma physicist turned philosopher, um, will speak to us about chapter two of his book uh, focused on relations. Uh, for about 20 minutes. And then we have three uh, esteemed scholars with us that uh, Dr. Eastman has engaged with in his book. Uh, Randall Oxier is here from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, where he is professor of philosophy as well as communication studies. Uh, we have Professor Michael Epperson, who's a research professor and founding director of the Consortium for Philosophy and the Natural Sciences at California State University in Sacramento. And we have uh, Elias Zafiris, who is professor of mathematics from the University of Athens. And so after Tim speaks for about 20 minutes, I'll invite each of them uh, to offer uh, remarks for about 10 minutes each. And then we'll move to a open discussion among all the panelists. Um, and then after that, we will open the floor to comments and questions from uh, everyone else. All right. So uh, with that, I turn it over uh, to Dr. Eastman or, or Tim, uh, as, as uh, I refer to you as a friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just everyone should just call me Tim and uh, my wife, Carolyn, Carolyn Brown is with me here. And uh, then I had written up some notes here to speak from. And then about <laughs> half hour ago, she said, oh, you're missing this and that. And she started browbeating me about it. And I had to make further changes and so forth. So I mean, this is support being browbeaten. <laughs> uh, so, so in chapter two, it's uh, an effort to uh, then lay the groundwork for the essential concepts, notions, and how to utilize the inspirations from quantum physics to then uh, develop the concepts I need for the remainder of the book. Uh, I had initially thought I would take the 13 Gordian knots uh, and then use those as focal points for 13 chapters or something like that. But I ended up working with uh, cross-cutting notions and completely re reorganizing in a way that was broader than that. Uh, so in the terms of the fundamental notions, as mentioned briefly in the first chapter, uh, I have, well, what is it that it, one can not avoid a re returning to uh, at a most fundamental level? And it seemed to me that there's at least three, perhaps more, uh, one being process grounded in uh, the concept of succession. Uh, and I'll come back to that. And uh, logic, uh, a, a incorporating it, uh, two types of logic, uh, that involve both or reference both actuality and potentiality and possibility, um, and then relation, uh, including both uh, triadic uh, three or more and local global relations. So for this um, overall integrative framework that I've called the relational framework or logoi framework using the uh, Latin reference to the plural of relation logoi framework, that the overall context for succession depends on both the standard 
on off or yes no uh, a binary or dyadic uh, boolean logic of actualizations you know with outcomes of measurements have to be either the spin the electron is up or down what not not somehow in between this uh, and but then in addition a multi-valued non-boolean logic of potentialities um, using the Latin potentia or plural potentiae. I've often referred then in the book to landscapes of potentiae of, uh, of multi, multiple possibilities. So that, and that there's associated logic with that that comes out of the quantum physics. That'll be addressed by um, Mike and Elias in their comments later. Most importantly, I'm uh, noting how from the basic science that we realize that the real most inclusively understood is constituted by both the actual and the possible. The concept of relations, whether actual or potential incorporates part versus whole or myriology, internal versus external relations, uh, and not just dyadic, but also triadic relations. Uh, the whole field of semiotics or semiosis uh, refers to uh, the triadic relations. And then and as well, more recently, in the last 40, 50 years, the possibility of a new mathematics that can handle algebra as a relations, topoi or category theory, which is a specialty of uh, our colleague Elias Zafiris, who is with us during this discussion. Uh, he's an excellent mathematical physicist that is on top of those issues. So that such category theory can handle all types of real relations, including local global relations. For the Logoi framework, I hypothesized three fundamental orders of ontology. That is the nature of being or becoming. That is one, the order of actualizations. Secondly, an order of potentia or landscapes of potentia. And thirdly, an order of ultimacies. I'm thinking now by hypothesis, a philosophic claim as being really truly fundamental orders that undergird or are ground of uh, all, all else. And these orders correlate with Jim Bradley's three basic questions concerning in turn the nature of difference. That is the issue of dyadic input output or numbers or quantification. That is what the focus point of science. The nature of order, uh, triadic order or reference to context in some way, semiotics, qualia and related. And the question of origin, ultimacies of the spiritual dimension. In other words, there's three basic questions about difference, order, and origin that then correlate with these orders of actualization, potentia, and that of ultimacies. In a paper with uh, Professor George Shields, who uh, my sadly, my friend has passed away a year ago, working out implications of formal logic, contemporary physics, and philosophy, we argued how triads, not dyads, are metaphysically primal. That symmetry within an all embracing and contextualized symmetry is an ultimate conceptual pattern. This correlates with the ubiquity of semiotic relations, that is, signs in some way or other, anything that stands for something else, not just the input output two place dyad, dyad, but triads of input output context. Consider is there any kind of understanding of input output that you're aware of in any way? your personal experience or some scientific experiment, anything in which there is not some implicit reference one way or the other to context, such that it's always the case of some kind of input, output, context, triadic. I think not. An associated foundational epistemology about ways of knowing that we discussed in chapter one emerges from naturally from this fundamental triadicity, namely the way ways of context independence, that is numbers, the way of numbers, science, quantitative input output. Secondly, of context emphasis, such as what we have in semiotics and arts and humanities. And then finally, third of ultimate context that we have obtained in the spiritual dimension. A few common concepts are conspicuously absent in this integrative speculative framework, the Logoi framework uh, in its core metaphysics because they can be considered as derivative notions, not truly metaphysically fundamental, however much they may be essential to measurement and scientific applications. These derivative notions, among others, include physical law versus constraints on potentia by applying, for example, Feynman's principle of least action, 
In other words, I'm not saying, I'm saying that physical law, laws that typically are considered as absolutely fundamental are not fundamental, they're derivative. Causality with its epistemic focus versus ontic causation. So I'm saying causation in some sense is fun, truly fundamental, but causality is not. Time versus temporality. So even the notion of time space or time like in relativity theory is in a sense derivative. Uh, and that the notion of space time metric, I would argue is derivative. Derivative in that case from quantum field theory constraints on fundamental extension. <clears throat> Again, these are concepts that are often presumed to be fundamental, whether it be space time in the discussions of philosophy of relativity theory or of physical law, uh, so often presumed to be fundamental. And I'm saying they're not necessarily fundamental. There's more fundamental notions from which we can obtain these as derivative notions. Fundamental processes arise from never ending succession of events as both Jorge Novo and Lehman McHenry have argued and I'm sad that Lehman not, not able to join us. He's in transit right now, otherwise he would have. Perhaps we can get him to help us out in another dialogue. Um, and each event uh, of such a succession of events is constituted by a combination of immediate physical inputs, relationships, and potentia for their realization. All features foundational contemporary field theory in physics. Temporality and spatiality are coextensive with such process and the asymmetry of time emerges from the inevitable successiveness of such process. Arguments for the bi-directionality of time are based on models effectively of pre-space trajectories within landscapes of potentia and never not and not directly on measured physical parameters. Symmetry applies to pre-space potentia and, traje and trajectories, but the measurement process and successive actualizations, that's the central heart of contemporary science and what we work with is correlation of measurements such measurements and successive actualizations break such symmetry so that asymmetry is fundamental uh, in that sense. Process, logic, and relations are the most fundamental notions. Physical relations, laws, although basic for science, are derivative relative to this most fundamental level. Nevertheless, very high levels of predictability can arise from such probabilistic law with constraints boundary conditions, initial conditions, and context, and so forth, being part of those constraints but they're not entailments or necessities per se, as in deductivist accounts about law. So I'm denying such deductivist accounts. The real world can exemplify very high levels of predictability determination, enough to get us to the moon, et cetera, but never ultimately exact entailments or determinism in the absolute sense, which is a notion that can characterize models, but never ultimately the fullness of reality, which always involves both the actual and the possible. The methodology of science is basically that of careful observation, experimentation, and model making. And the goal of the latter is to identify effective quantitative representations of measurement outcomes and physical relationships. For example, through mappings of variables, functions, and equations. Building on the proper and important reductive methodology of science, many interpreters have mistakenly extended such methodologically or epistemological reduction to a problematic ontological reduction, either in substance or process. The former exhibited by those who presuppose reductive materialism and the latter by some expositors of process thought. Alternatively, instead of presuming that Whitehead's term actual entity or equivalently Hartshorn's dynamic particular is uniquely micro scale, Randall Oxier and Gary Hurstein uh, were with us today, uh, I'm very pleased, argue in their outstanding work, Con Quantum of Explanation, that this concept is best interpreted as a metaphysical quantum of explanation whose exemplars, if mostly microscale, can in principle be of any scale. Microscale reductive explanations, whether in science or philosophy, provide simplicity and apparent explanatory power. Uh, exhibit, for example, over the past couple hundred years, the power of basically the concept of atomism, uh, important uh, essential concept to contemporary science, but not somehow ultimate. You know, yet these uh, micro reductive explanations are often at the expense of inclusiveness or contextual factors. Although multi-level context-driven explanatory frameworks, such as logoid framework, sacrifice simplicity, they achieve much greater inclusiveness and coherence, which enables critical rapprochement between the discourse of science and the discourse of everyday life, between the physicist's account of a chair and the chair is normally perceived. As Nicholas Rescher, the great philosopher, uh, has described it, 
quote, the ladder is solid and filled with material. The form is largely, former is largely empty space and replete with electromagnetic phenomena. Indeed, multi-scale, multi-level complexes of events as Lehman McHenry has shown in his excellent book, The Event Universe. You may have heard of exotic claims about quantum cosmology and this permeates the bookshelves in the science section. But most often, most quantum applications have nothing to do with such global aspirations most often based on problematic multiverse, hidden variable, or actualist narratives. Quantum process essential to any and all actualities, micro, meso, and macro, and without the use of so-called hidden variables, new interpretive approaches have finally succeeded in recent days, in recent uh, couple decades, to understanding quantum processes in a way that incorporates its fundamentally indeterminate features. In particular, the relational, re relational reality approach pioneered by Michael Epson and Elia Sefiris, who are both thankfully with us today, is a central component of the Logoi framework. In addition to independent research by Ruth Kastner, who will join us uh, in another session, uh, Hans Primus, who unfortunately passed away in 2012, and Stuart Kaufman, among others. By avoiding the presuppositions of actualism, nominalism, or determinism that undermines almost all of their interpretive frameworks for understanding quantum physics, for example, the many worlds interpretation, certain Bohmian approaches, etc., their advances in the philosophy of physics have demonstrated the need for our distinction within the conception of full ontological reality of both actualizations and landscapes of potential. The re relational reality approach, or one may say relational realism, accommodates the highly successful Copenhagen interpretation as applicable to the logic of actualizations with its epistemic emphasis and adds a category or topoi theory enhanced realist treatment capable of handling the logic of potentia as well. In this way, we can properly handle the problem of measurement necessarily involving aspects of abstraction, approximation or model making and avoid the presupposition of actualism which has become a major impediment to understanding the basis for indeterminacy in quantum physics. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So I'm going to um, invite our panelists in alphabetical order uh, to share their thoughts. I just want to make one reminder, though, um, for the next session that it's important for each of the Saturday sessions to RSVP. There's a separate Zoom link for each, and if you don't RSVP, uh, Richard with the Cobb Institute, and thank you to Richard for helping with logistics behind the scenes. He won't be able to get the link to you. So um, if you want to join us next time, make sure you do RSVP, and I think Richard will send that RSVP link around after our session today. Um, so let's turn it over to uh, Professor Oxier or Randy uh, for his uh, reflections. Please go ahead. The floor should be yours as soon as you are unmuted. There you go. All right. So um, I wrote a 10 page single space paper <laughs> for this, which I won't read, but I sent it to uh, Tim and uh, Matt and John Cobb. And uh, we had an interesting exchange about that. Uh, I am going to read the beginning of it so that everybody understands how much I appreciate and agree with Tim's book. Uh, so I'm going to read just the beginning of my remarks, and from there I'm going to summarize it. Uh, so the remarks I have for this morning are only the beginning of what I have to say about this book. Thanks to the kind organizers of this series, I'm going to speak to the group twice more before we come to a close in December. Thus, I'm not going to try to fit my whole commentary into this morning. But I expect that the three pieces taken together are going to form quite a long <laughs> book review uh, by the time it's done. Uh, part of the reason for that, of course, is that the book is so good. Uh, so I want to emphasize that my tone in, in, in the commentary, the, both this one and the ones that are to come, must not be mistaken for something overly critical, although I am going to concentrate on points where I perceive differences between my views and Tim's. I am deeply appreciative of this book, not least because Tim has saved us all a lot of work. And what I mean by that uh, is the synthesis of all of these different views uh, that have been put out there over the last 25 years or so uh, uh, regarding, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of good people trying to extend Whitehead's work into the sorts of things that we know about physics now that we didn't know about in Whitehead's day, and in particular, there's a tremendous amount of dogmatism uh, uh, and an actualist dogmatism that is uh, that is rife in the physics community. Whenever they try to theorize, at least people have not been trained 
in either critical thinking or uh, in uh, the history of philosophy. And so very often they don't know what the philosophical alternatives are to the positions that they are advocating. And so it leads to a lot of actualist dogmatism. Tim's critique of actualism is the most important thing in this chapter, in my opinion, and throughout the book, it is incredibly valuable that we not fall into actualism. All right, so on this point and hundreds of others, I would gladly echo and extend on what Tim says in this book and elsewhere. I've known Tim for 25 years at least, and uh, I always find myself in fundamental agreement with him, even though I, I always want to talk about details. So I find him to be a thorough, sympathetic, and sober interpreter of the process tradition and to be firm where he sees dogmatism taking hold. I am glad that my past work, and especially what I've done with Gary Hurstein, has fallen mainly on the side of viewpoints that Tim could agree with and use in his project. Gary and I worked very hard for a very long time to get said what we wanted to say in our book, Quantum of Explanation. Uh, Gary can speak for himself, of course, but I was prevented for many years from publishing my views due to dogmatism of some elder Whitehead scholars who were not open to what I would call a balanced reading of Whitehead. And I'm more than happy to state that John Cobb and David Ray Griffin were not the problem. <laughs> they were, uh, the problem lay elsewhere. Um, so because of Tim's relative independence of academic structure, he could always say what he wanted to say, and that was a great boon to all of us. And it's no accident that those who were open-minded in the past and receptive to Tim's excellent contributions are very much, that's very much the group that is gathered here today. So in short, it's no surprise uh, that uh, Tim comes to be closely working with the group that I am now addressing, which is a credit both to Tim and to this group. Uh, I have seen other excellent thinkers buried and even destroyed academically by those with narrow minds and limited understanding of Whitehead. And I'm not in a forgiving mood regarding such people. Uh, one thing I do wanna add is that uh, mine and Gary's book, when written, was 210,000 words long. <laughs> and uh, uh, they made us cut 55,000 words out of the book, before, <laughs> which is a book in itself, before uh, Routledge would accept it. Most of what hit the floor was our engagement with the Whitehead community, uh, uh, detailed engagement on issues of this kind. And so uh, 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 in a way, the book is probably better for having less controversy in it. But it also left a lot of the story untold that needed to be told about what has happened in Whitehead scholarship. Now, there's a difference between Whitehead scholarship, so I'm going off script now. Um, there's a difference between Whitehead scholarship and what we're here to do today. This is not about Whitehead. This is about Tim's book, for one thing, and more importantly, it's about what do those of us who would like to extend the fundamental insights of the whole process tradition, what do we do in coming into constructive engagement with contemporary physics so while holding the line against actualist dogmatism. And so this is very much uh, in line with what Tim was saying. So I sent that 10 page paper out, single space, so it's really a 20 page paper, right? Uh, to uh, Tim and to Matt and to John Cobb. Uh, ahead of time we had a very uh, lively exchange about it. I invite Matt to send that paper uh, to everybody if, if, if they want it. So that they can see the but on many points it's quite technical and there's no point in going into it i think a general summary of what what i wrote down and the reasons for it is probably what's appropriate in in my short period of time here tim is really devoted uh to avoiding actualism and i essentially say he didn't manage to do it uh in my paper he didn't manage to avoid actualism what he's got is a very kinder, gentler, gentler, this is my view, kinder, gentler, generalized, pluralistic actualism. And the reason for it is this, he does not grant the possibility an independent role uh, uh, in his theory of potentiae. Um, uh, he uses the word possibility and potential more or less interchangeably, and he says he's going to do so. Um, uh, he doesn't, you know, he, this is not a, it's not something he's unconscious of. He usually uses potential or potentiate when he's talking about this phenomenon. How does he define it? Well, it's supposed to be the actual plus the possible. And it is for the most part, except that uh, 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 Gary and I stay a lot closer to Whitehead's framework 
than Tim does. And there's no law that says you have to stay close to Whitehead. So there's no, it doesn't automatically make what Gary and I have to say, say better. But one of the things that we say, and both of us have done uh, work well beyond quantum of explanation on this issue, um, is that you have to grant to possibility, which unfortunately is called the theory of eternal objects in Whitehead. That's got to be the poorest terminological choice in the history of philosophy uh, <laughs> because it has frightened off so many people, but it's really his theory of possibility. There, there are two ways of looking at possibility. One is as general potentiality, which means all of the possibilities that are illustrated in what's actual, both divine actuality uh, and, uh, uh, and the system of actual entities. Divine actuality and the system of actual entities taken together is the system of actuality for Whitehead. This is all, um, I quote the places in Process and Reality where he sets this out. The theory of general potentiality is very close to what Tim is talking about when he has potentiate. But what that means is that means possibility viewed from the standpoint of actuality. Now, a lot of people who Gary and I have uh, criticized roundly say that's all there is to possibility. They don't like these moments in Whitehead and uh, Granville Henry in particular points out a couple of places in science in the modern world where Whitehead clearly says that possibility is independent of all actuality. He maintains that view throughout his, uh, throughout his career. Uh, it's not new in science in the modern world and it doesn't disappear after science in the modern world. He always maintained that there was an independence of possibility. And now the question is whether there is something like a logic of that kind of possibility. Obviously, since we're viewing it from the standpoint of the actual, whenever we talk about it, there is a certain hypothetical that has to be entered uh, in in order to have a discussion about the order of possibility as it would be, might have been, might be independent of, um, of actuality. But it is very important. And part of the reason is, is that in order to main the triadicity that Tim rightly emphasizes in his book, you really cannot reduce possibility to either God or to the system of actual entities or to an actual entity in its actual world. So sticking with the ontological principle, you must grant to the eternal objects some independence and some finality. And that means that there has got to be some kind of an order that is associated with possibility, regardless of whether it's actual. Now, that's not an easy thing to get at. It's a very difficult thing to get at. And what Tim does in order to try to break out, if you might want to call it, of the, of the narrow actualist dogmatism, um, uh, he, he relies on the reworking of, of Boolean algebra uh, by Primus. Which is, which is very interesting and it's very good, but it actually isn't necessary because Whitehead did this himself in the, theory, in the treatise on universal algebra. He rendered uh, the actualist Boolean um, uh, um, a duality uh, into a plural algebra in the, uh, um, uh, in the treatise on universal algebra. But I can understand how that might get overlooked because the central operational features of that algebra were intended for a second volume of the treatise in universal algebra. That didn't get written, um, uh, but it was then intended for a volume in Principia Mathematica. What this really is, is it's uh, Whitehead's theory of the algebraization of space. But of course, his conception of space, while he gets at it through a hypothesis of, uh, of an extensive continuum, his theory of space includes, uh, uh, as Gary likes to say, both, both the accretion of value and narrative intelligibility. You can achieve narrative intelligibility algebraically. And so that turns out finally, so uh, Whitehead uh, fooled around with it for decades and he finally published it as part four of Process and Reality. By the time it came out in that form, he had decided to express it as an axiomatic system. And that was unfortunate in a number of ways, but I think he was in a hurry by that time. It's, in, it's in for, unfortunate in a number of ways because it actually is an algebra, but it was algebraized after Whitehead by Suzanne Langer. Um, she, uh, she, in her uh, dissertation and also in her symbolic logic book, expressed the theory of extensive connection as an algebra. 
Um, uh, and so the algebra that you're looking for, Tim, already exists. It's just been completely ignored by people. However, there is good news. Uh, the good news is, I'll just put this in here. In chapters 19, I'm putting this in the chat, uh, in the chat, in chapters 19 of Logic from Images to, uh, uh, to Digits, um, I bring together both the, du the, the, the actualist Boolean algebra and Suzanne Langer's algebraization of Whitehead theory of extensive connection. That's chapters 19 through 23 of this book. And so um, what I wanna do is suggest that staying closer to Whitehead with regard to extensive connection yields real results relative to how we think about physics. And the reason is, is that it characterizes determinate order, in other words, the order of possibility, independently of uh, actualist con uh, concerns and considerations. And so I don't think that Tim managed to get that, so I'm drawing to a close now. I don't think Tim managed to get that. Um, and I actually don't think that anybody has spent enough time on the order of the logic of possibility. The stuff that the modal logicians do is completely irrelevant to this. These are modes of necessity, not of possibility uh, that these guys are theorizing. It has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. And so the theory of determinate order as a theory of possibility, it's independent actually gives us a contrasting standpoint from which to view quantum actuality as well as quantum possibility, two different modes of order. So when Tim moves in chapter two directly from this general schema of, uh, of potentia and process and relations and ultimate, uh, when he moves directly from that to a theory of localization and possible measurement, that's something that I want to avoid. And I think Gary agrees, but he can speak for himself. I want to avoid localization altogether because there is no difference between something being actually somewhere and it being virtually everywhere. Those are the same. Um, uh, and you have to have a theory about it being virtually everywhere as well as a theory about it being actually somewhere. And if you approach quantum physics as if the main idea is to figure out where in time or where in space, or we've done away with space time, thank God, but, but where in space time, the dogmatic physicists, uh, 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 the phenomena are that we are seeking to know, that we are seeking to understand, that we're seeking to be aware of. If you insist that they be somewhere, some when, in order for us to know them from some actual standpoint, you've only got half the story. Uh, the rest of the story has to do with how they fit into a determinate order of possibility. Uh, and if you'd like to talk about how I theorize that and Gary theorizes it as well, uh, it is different from what physicists do. It's different from what Michael and uh, Elias are doing. It's different from what Tim is doing, but I think it bears on these questions. So thank you. Thank you, Randy. Um, you've given us a lot to, to ponder and I hope we do circle back uh, during the uh, open dialogue. There are a couple of questions in the chat already. Um, but I want to turn now, uh, moving in alphabetical order to Professor Epperson. Um, the floor is yours for about 10 minutes or so. Make sure that you are unmuted and then go for it. Hey, I'm going to try to keep my eye on the clock too, but if I, if I go over, sometimes I forget, you know what I mean? I don't sure. Care. Internal keeping track of time. Somebody say something. Okay. But I'm going to try to keep my eye. Um, but uh, Randy, thanks uh, for all of that. Um, it's weird because I was, sorry, that's, I have a parrot. Okay, he'll be quiet in a second, but that was what that was. Um, I, I, I was thinking along the same lines as you actually, in terms of the one thing that I wish were maybe um, discussed a little bit, more, you know, in, you can't discuss everything in chapter two, but I hit on the same idea of the way, the way that potentiality um, um, was was discussed in chapter two and the distinction, the Whiteheadian distinction between uh, real potentiality, that is potentiality grounded in some some actual occasion, and pure, what he, Whitehead terms pure potentiality, um, and uh, those two things are very different. Um, and I agree with you about uh, you know the unfortunate term eternal objects because it leads to a a complete misunderstanding of what Whitehead means ultimately by pure potentiality, because that's what 
my on my reading of Whitehead, that's what eternal objects are. There, I think he he, uh, he uses the the alternative uh, phrasing, pure potentiality for the specific determination of fact. So what is that? Well, it's 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 uncontextualized potentiality. Uh, I, I, I'm often reminded of um, when I think of that. Kant in, in uh, 1763, his pre-critical period, which should be looked at more carefully, I think, by, by everybody who's interested in, in these types of things. He had this, this argument for the existence of God. It was sort of a counter to Anselm's um, ontological argument. I think it was called uh, the, the, something like the only, um, the only possible argument, um, what was it? Does anyone know? I'm, I'm, I'm blanking out a little bit. The only possible argument um, in support of a demonstration of God's existence. And he basically argues that rather than arguing uh, uh, for the existence of God as some sort of necessary primordial extant, he says that because there's possibility, just, just pure potentiality, um, that's actually a more convincing argument for the existence of God because what it does is it ontologizes pure potentiality. And um, I think you're right that we want there to be some sort of, I think you use the phrase determinate order um, of, of potentiality um, because the idea of, of pure potentiality is so abstract. Um, uh, but the question is what, what would that order be? I think of it actually as an indeterminate order of potentiality because you know, uh, for me, what I look for as exemplified in quantum mechanics is a sort of uh, conditioned indeterminacy. So whatever it is that conditions pure potentiality, and again, pure potentiality is, 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 is the idea of potentiality as abstracted as you can get it from actuality. It's not grounded in any particular um, actual occasion. Um, it, whatever the conditioning principles are, I, I don't know that they're determined principles, but, but, but I, I often think of, uh, maybe something like um, um, Aristotle's principle of non-contradiction excluded middle. You know, with those two things uh, in place, you, you have a way of generalizing potentiality um, in, in, in a way at least that comports with quantum mechanics for me. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna screen share. I, I hope you don't, you don't mind everybody. And forgive me if I, uh, my, my, I should be good at this after teaching via Zoom for a year, but it's too much for me. Okay, here we go. I'm going to share a little slide here, just hopefully. Does that, is, can you see that, everybody? I can't uh, yes, see what you yeah, see, we, but uh, sure okay. Can. Um, so if you look at the, the equation at the top there, and, and my apologies for, for those, those of you who don't know tons about quantum mechanics, but it's not important. Just if you look at the Greek letter psi on the left, um, for me, this is an uncontextualized potential state. So we have no measurement basis yet. We don't, we, there, there's nothing, but there's, there's, there's something real. I mean, this is, as a state, um, it's, at least in physics, it's considered to be something that's ontologically significant. It's, so it's a state of a system, but it has not yet been contextualized. And uh, just to map this back onto Tim's um, framework, his Persian framework, so that would be um, a firstness. There, as you can see, it's just this, this something is real, something something in the world is real, whatever it is I'm interested in measuring, um, and it's an actuality, but it is, it is potentialized. The presupposition is that it's going to become something else. Um, and uh, so that might map onto the first category there. Now it's secondness that where the context comes into play. Um, so we have an evolution of, of, of an initial actual state now contextualized by some, some measurement basis, some, something that's actual that you're using to contextualize this measurement that's in, that's in process, an actual occasion in process. Um, and um, so the context, of course, in this case is Schrodinger's cat being alive or dead. And in, the, in that second uh, category there, um, Context is present because we obviously can see that we're dealing with a cat and whether the cat is alive or dead. But in the pure state, uh, it's, it, the, the, you don't have much more than that. You just have, okay, there's a context, but what does the context do? What is it doing to condition the, uh, the, this pure potentiality? 
um, what, what, what it, how does it, how does it uh, uh, again, the word I like, or the phrase I like is conditioned indeterminacy, but how does the conditioning take place? Well, that's where the thirdness comes into play. And you see the evolution of potential outcome states to probable outcome states. This is where the, the, the pure potentiality that was present in the firstness section becomes um, a real potentiality. And the cat being alive or dead um, as a context, it does something to the pure potentiality. It reduces, in quantum mechanics, we would say that it, that it, that it reduces it. Von Neumann calls this the, uh, the, the process one. It's a non-unitary reduction of the pure potentiality that, that we begin with in the measurement. And so now we have, instead of the cat as alive and dead, those are the two different possible states, two different potential states. Now we have the cat as alive or dead, and really it's an exclusive or. Um, so what context does is it, it reduces pure potentiality to real potentiality in whiteheading language. And um, what it does in terms of quantum mechanics is it takes all of the and, the and relationships in the, in the pure state and it reduces them into exclusive or uh, relationships in the mixed state quantum mechanics. And then from there, uh, uh, there's the presupposition of the Born rule, which I, I think of as sort of a, an exemplification of the principle of the excluded middle. One of those two uh, uh, probable states is guaranteed to be actual ter terminal of the measurement. Um, and, but, but going back to this idea of, of, of the distinction between pure potentiality and real potentiality. For me, this comes into play right there between the, the, the firstness category and the secondness category. And then um, what kind of mileage do you get out of that reduction of the pure state of, of pure potentiality to real potentiality? Well, the mileage you get is you get the principle of the excluded middle is satisfied. It means you're going to have one of those potentialities that evolve to become probabilities, one of those possibilities is going to be actual terminal of that relationship. And then if I, if I can just go to another slide here, the next one, um, uh, this is just another way of framing what I just described. Um, and it, it does so in a, perhaps a little more, uh, a little more detail, but I just wanted to throw that up there for, for those who are interested in this distinction between pure and real potentiality in Whitehead. This is one way of sort of connecting that to what Tim uh, did it really well, by the way, in chapter two. By the way, Tim, I mean, we've been talking about your book quite a bit throughout the process of writing it, but it's just fantastic. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And, and by the way, you know, 70 to 80%, probably 90% of the references you made, the amount of research that, that, that you did here, I, I, don't, I don't recognize some, the majority of your references. So now I have a ton of reading that I'm gonna have to do. So thanks a lot for that. Um, but uh, seriously, uh, it was just just a wonderful um, book. But anyway, let me stop the, the uh, screen share. Oh, good Lord, what did I just do here? Okay, let me get this, let me get this. Um, sorry. Um, oh, here we go, stop share. Okay, ah, ah, okay. So that, that was the, the, the one thing I wanted to say that I, I, I agree with you, Randy, the, the, this is the distinction between pure and real potentiality, at least for Whiteheadians, this is a, a, a just crucial. And again, for the, I would urge you to, if you're interested in this distinction, look at this treatise by Kant that I, that I mentioned, because it's, re, it's really amazing. Uh, he, he, is, he is appreciating the ontological significance of, of, of potentiality as being um, almost more important than, than the ontological, the obvious ontological significance of actuality. Um, and to me, it's very consonant with, the, or it resonates very well with, um, with, with Whitehead's argument. And I see it exemplified in quantum mechanics, like I said, in, in just the concept of, uh, of, of the evolution of potentiality in the pure state to, um, to a probability um, in, the, in the mixed state. Um, or as I said, that's non, the idea of non-unitary reduction, um, which is not everybody in quantum mechanics thinks that's important, by the way. That's just, that happens to be my, my particular feeling um, that, that quantum mechanics, and by the way, I, I should say also, um, uh, unitary reduction would be uh, reflected in Tim's framework um, as, as this dyad, where you go from actual initial state to actual final state. 
And you know that's why the equal sign in that equation at the top of the, the slide is it's, it's so important in physics is that hey, whatever the initial state is, the final state, you know ultimately these these are fully reversible. it's it's all the same. The, 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 the predicate contains everything in the subject. There's nothing novel um, after the, the, the measurement um, interaction. And that would be sort of the dyadic move. But the triadic move, for me, is, um, is um, uh, um, uh, represented in Tim's framework and the Persian framework as this, the triadic um, uh, structure, where you have initial actuality, and then you have some sort of contextualization of, of a presupposed potentialization of that initial actuality. Um, and what, 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 the, what the integration of context there, contextualized potentiality, what that does in quantum mechanics anyway, is it allows you to, uh, it, it allows for the evolution of um, a pure state of just a jumble of potential outcomes, none of which are conditioned by non-contradiction or excluded middle initially. Um, that state evolves to become the mixed state. And um, that evolution in quantum mechanics for me is the most important thing about quantum mechanics because without that, you don't have uh, an outcome state. So the, for me, the problem of measurement is ultimately about not, the, not why you have an actual state terminal of measurement. For me, it's more about why you get the mixed state from the pure state. And the way you do that, if as, as a Whiteheadian, I would say, well, the way that happens is that you have a contextualization of the pure potentiality that you begin that you begin with, um, and um, um, uh, so anyway. Uh, did I have anything else? I don't think I have. Any, I just wanted to, that. That's about all I have. To, there's not a lot of time to get into other stuff, but anyway, I just wanted to to uh, to 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 follow up on, um, on 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 Randy's comments, which were which were awesome. So, is that enough time? Is that, is that, are we about right for 10 minutes? That was perfect, Michael. Thank you. Okay, okay, um, okay. thanks. I'm always happy to return to Kant, um, particularly the pre-critical period. And Anderson Weeks was kind enough to put the title in German and English of the text uh, that Michael was referring to. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, with that, we turn to our final panelist, uh, Professor Zafiris. Uh, as soon as you are unmuted, the floor is yours. Go for it. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, congratulations, Tim, for this uh, really outstanding work. Uh, so I, I would like to, to make some brief comments on, uh, on the notion of a relation, because uh, for me, this is uh, uh, the key issue in the sense that uh, when we use, for example, in quantum mechanics or in the philosophy of quantum mechanics, uh, the notion of a relation, it's impossible to give uh, to this notion the, the classical meaning. Now what I mean, first of all, by classical meaning. Uh, the notion of a relation comes uh, from uh, set theory and uh, propositional logic. Uh, in this context, when you talk about relations, uh, the relations pertains between uh, sets. So you need to have the ability to distinguish with precision elements. If you do not have any means to distinguish elements, you cannot talk about sets. In this way, when we talk in quantum mechanics about the uh, state space, this space is not a set because a priori we do not have any means to distinguish elements. This makes the notion of relation now more complicated in the sense now uh, how, how category theory somehow resolves this issue. I mean, what is the, uh, the difference that category theory makes in comparison to the impossibility of formalizing relations using elements, because you do not have, as I said, a priori any means to distinguish elements. So in the scheme uh, that uh, I proposed, and somehow uh, it appears in the book we wrote with Michael, and we have talked with Tim 
in many occasions about it. Uh, the idea is that we need a way to think about quantum objects. These are totally unknown objects in the sense that you cannot distinguish anything about, for example, of an electron. So you need to uh, devise some means to bring it to a different scale, the macroscopic scale, let's say. So instead of analyzing this space, you can call it abstract space of pure potential because it's totally indiscreet and you do not have any means to distinguish anything within this space. So instead of doing analysis, so dissecting this space in terms of elements, what you do is you adjoin structures that are related with experiments. Okay, these are uh, the, 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 how the notions of Boolean frames, okay, which are actually uh, uh, Boolean propositional structures, they fit in this totally unknown quantum space. So uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is crucial. So instead of analyzing, you adjoin frames. And the issue is now that one single frame is impossible to give you the whole information about this unknown space of states. So what you need, you need to have a whole multiplicity of them. And the idea is to cover this unknown space with the minimum number of Boolean frames out of which is possible to obtain some kind of information. So you can start distinguishing things in terms of events. This is what gives rise to the actualization because initially you do not have any means to actualize events. So this is a process which is called uh, adjunction. This is uh, quite recent. It's very different from the algebraic framework because uh, the algebras and the, uh, the connections that you can frame in algebraic language, they are based on an underlying set theoretic background, which by default, you do not have at your disposal when you talk about quantum space or where you apply it in any situation that involves potentiality. So the idea now uh, is that instead of analyzing in terms of elements, you try to define through these covers a topology. This is the notion of a topology. So the covering gives rise to the notion of a topology. So you try to make the space of states to obtain the structure of a topological space. The idea out of it is that since out of each Boolean frame, you can observe something, how is it possible to have some means of gluing or pasting together all these frames so that you can, you can go from the local level to some global level to which you do not have a direct access. This is the main problem. And this is somehow where the notion of uh, local global relations proves to be very significant uh, when we talk about uh, quantum space of states or in my view, in any situation which involves potentiality. The notion of a topology gives you uh, the means to find a way to partition, so to start distinguishing different parts, the different parts is what I call the local uh, things, within something where you cannot distinguish anything because it belongs to a different scale, because it involves all these potentiality issues and tell you a better way to think about an electron, how you can see an electron, how you can form logical relations 
pertaining to the behavior of an electron. So uh, this process now, we can see it as a way of encoding this pure potentiality in terms of observables. That's the first stage. The, the second stage is a way to, uh, to find a way to glue together different observables. So you make a kind of maximal extensions, which gives you the real potentialities now in this uh, totally unknown space. The third stage is to go from the domain of pure potentiality to the domain of possibility, which will mathematically express as probability, because the mathematical way to express uh, possibility is using measure theory. Okay. In order to do measure theory, you need to have some topology. Okay, so these are the steps when you do not have at your disposal a set of elements. So the possibility now gives rise to what we call the probabilities, the Born rule, and so on. But we haven't finished yet. We need a way to decode. So we need a kind of inverse bridge to go back to qualify and to quantify the quantum space of states. This is now a notion which is called the shift, okay, which gives you the, the, a, an isomorphic uh, representation of the thing that you had no idea initially, but you managed through covering to obtain information in terms of maximal compatible families of observables. Now, because, because uh, in the quantum uh, world, you have this issue which is called complementarity. Very simply, you cannot specify, for example, the position and the momentum of what you call an electron or a photon simultaneously. Out of the shift theoretic structure, what you get as a global attribute, which in my view gives a, a very precise meaning to the notion of an eternal object, because it's a kind of a universal, and it is not an abstract universal, but a concrete universal in the sense of platonic uh, philosophy, is a discussion between the white and the whiteness. Uh, this is what is called now a geometric phase. The geometric phase is how you globally characterize uh, uh, a quantum space or a space where you have free room and you have uh, for potential relations. So the, the actualities do not exhaust the quantum space of states. So you have extra degrees of freedom, but all these degrees of freedom, they have now a global manifestation in terms of a geometric phase. And this geometric phase now is what gives rise, for example, to the interference effect. It is what gives rise to what we call entanglement. So you have uh, systems which are very far apart in space. And at the same time, due to this uh, connective uh, geometric phases, they can be compatible in terms of observables, in terms of spin, in terms of momentum, and so on. Uh, so uh, I just want to wrap up now that the notion of relation as it appears in, in uh, if we take seriously category theory is very different from both the set theoretic framework, which is totally, uh, in my view, inappropriate for handling uh, domains where you have potentiality. And that's an effect, all these formalisms of uh, uh, formal logic, of uh, modal logic, uh, they are not appropriate for the simple reason that you do not have a way to distinguish anything there. You have what is called pure states. Okay, a pure state cannot be expressed in terms of uh, propositional elements without a covering, without this kind of uh, contextualization or localization in mathematical terms of a topology. Uh, my final comment is that this notion now of localization does have to do anything with the notion of locality in space-time. 
So all the scheme that I described is totally space-time independent. So the notion of locality pertains to how you cover this pure potential. You can devise ways to cover it totally independently of position in space-time. The reason is that if you make a measurement in quantum mechanics or in physics in general, the measurement has to be reproducible. So it doesn't matter if you make the measurement in Athens or in New York or in Sacramento or wherever you like. There are all these uh, symmetries which make a measurement space-time independent. So the notion of locality is founded non, not in space-time, but in terms of uh, this local Boolean phrase. The reason is that you can uh, qualify an observable in terms of a yes, no proposition. This is what corresponds to an event. And this is independent of your location in space and time or in space time. Okay, uh, this was my, uh, my comment. I hope I didn't take a lot of time and I finish here. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Uh, Zephyrus. Um, and thanks to all of our panelists. I'm gonna hand it back to Tim in a second here to see if he has any comments. Um, yeah, I know I learned a lot uh, here and especially a lot about um, what I still uh, need to understand. Um, this logic of possibility, uh, the critique of actualism, the different forms of possibility that Whitehead demarcates for us, pure and real uh, possibility or potentiality. These are important distinctions that I know Tim uh, was, was keen to demarcate in his book, but I wonder, um, Tim, if you have any, any thoughts in response to what's been shared here. Well, th thanks to Michael and Elias for their wonderful uh, uh, comments there. Uh, really excellent, and, and, and Randy. Uh, so Elias, to, your comments just to make me think about the issue of uh, uh, nominalism. Uh, among philosophers, they often, so to speak, uh, presume that we can reduce so to speak, the distinct, uh, distinct distinctions and uh, sorting out of things in the world in a way that necessarily can map, be mapped down to particulars, uh, particular items and so forth. That nominalism refers to that notion, uh, so to speak, uh, necessarily a kind of implicit reduction. Uh, and I understand from the fundamental mathematics and the mathematical physics that you're bringing out that uh, that kind of insistence on anomalous orientation associates with the need for distinction of elements and so forth, but that your framework of a category topoi theory approach enables one to not be just stuck in that, uh, uh, that uh, subset of framing possibility, but a, a general algebra that can handle both the particular actualizations the Boolean side and this non-Boolean broader uh, apparatus that can handle possibility, even the possibility that Randy refers to as pure possibility. Does that all make sense? Uh, yes, it makes perfect sense. Uh, if I can add one, one comment, uh, is uh, the big problem is that uh, we usually start with the notion of an element. So if you use uh, as a basis a set, the presupposition for a set is to have a way to talk about its elements. So you need uh, a means to distinguish elements. And uh, in physics and uh, in many other situations, uh, not idealized, uh, this is a priori impossible. So starting from the notion of, of a set uh, has caused troubles, uh, not only in the foundations of mathematics, of which uh, we already know for more than 100 years now, but especially in the foundations of, uh, of physics and uh, the philosophy of physics. So the idea is to, to, to think of another uh, way to talk about uh, 
uh, things which belong to a different scale. Now, the idea is that you can have, for example, two electrons, which you cannot observe, but how these electrons interact can be brought into the macroscopic scale. So you can have two unknown things, but what you call the relation between these things can be known. So you do not need to know the objects in order to access the relations between the objects. And uh, with uh, category theory, of course, with uh, topology as well, uh, you have a way to form this type of relations, which somehow, um, if I can make a metaphor, is uh, the very old ancient Greek game of uh, breaking things into congruence. Where, uh, at least in my understanding, this is the foundation of, uh, of the notion of a logos in, uh, in Heraclitus and also in the, in the Pythagorean philosophy, but also in the, in the Stoics with this notion of uh, logos uh, spermaticos. So how you can bring things into congruence, things to, uh, uh, for which you do not have a direct access. So you do not know uh, elements, but you can figure out indirectly relations. But these relations are categorical relations. They are not relations between elements. So this is how I, I, uh, I see this. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Matt, can I, can I address what Evie has said? <clears throat> Please, Randy. Uh, the very thing that he says is a priori impossible is what I do in chapters 19 through 23 of my logic book. And so one of us must be wrong. <laughs> and so uh, um, uh, it is possible to theorize. It's not, I don't think it's possible mathematically, but it is possible logically to theorize the infinite. Um, uh, and so the, the idea that somehow in order to draw a line around a set in some way uh, or a group in some way, such that the line is both open and closed, this can be done logically but I don't know whether it can be done mathematically. I'm not a mathematician, I'm a logician, right? But, um, <clears throat> but anyway, I, I think that what I was saying ab about, I mean, I agree with everything that Elias and Michael said, I still regard it as a kinder, gentler actualism. I don't think that any of them has actually addressed possibility and the independence of possibility, nor the structure or the order of possibility. And so I'm, I, I'll, I'll, I'll express my negative view and shut up. But if somebody wants to see what, what addressing possibility would look like in a diagram, I can, I can post it. <laughs> in other words, uh, Randy, I gather that you're saying that the notion of pure possibility as you have expressed it and how Michael has expressed it are somehow different. Uh, yeah, they're, 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 they are different. I think that my notion includes everything that Michael is saying, uh, but that this is a pluralistic, kinder, gentler, open actualism. <laughs> that Whitehead's theory of eternal object isn't, uh, eternal objects isn't really addressed in this. The theory of extensive connection is not a theory of space. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, and the fact that it's, it's expressed axiomatically in process and reality is um, it's unfortunate because if you look at the universal algebra and if you look at the draft material for what was going to be another volume of Principia Mathematica, you begin to see that what he was working with uh, as a theory of extension has to do with the determinate order that, so, so when Michael says indeterminate order, I think, I think he's got what he means. I mean, he's right. But what I'm talking about as a theory of determinate order includes the indeterminate order that is made indeterminate from some actual standpoint. The determinate order I'm interested in is an open determinacy that has to do with the relations of possibilities with one another. This is what Elias said is unknowable. I think it is unknowable in a sense that it's not completely knowable, nor is it space. It can't really be brought under a theory of space, but it can be algebra, uh, algebraized. Um, and so would you give me permission to just post a diagram real quick to show how that works? Is that all right? Sure. Do you have the, 
screen sharing uh, button on your. Yeah, I do. So let me let me call it up real quick. Gary and I have been chatting about this. Uh, so this is uh, this is how you get out of the sort of uh, uh, the the sort of conundrum that Elias has put forward. Anything that's actual or that is um, analyzed from the point of view of the actual is going to be on that dark black line. But um, if we render a one to one relationship uh, between everything actual and its character as possible, that's above the, low, the dark black line, right? Below the dark, uh, uh, the dark black line is its actuality. This is an event or a durational epoch, if you want to call it that. No time is, we don't have to require that any time elapses because this applies regardless of how much time elapses. Uh, the, the series of ones and zeros just represents the structure of that event, whatever it is. So I've randomized those. Uh, but what happens is, is that through the egress of the possibilities that do not ingress in the event, you have an alternative and that alternative has a structure. So, uh, so where we have maximal information that was not actual, we have zeros at the, on the top line. Where we have uh, com complete information that is closed, we have ones above the line. This provides us with, uh, uh, with a way of, of understanding the determinate order of the possibilities that are independent of the actuality. Now, each one of those ones and zeros on the top line is an infinity of possible analysis. But we do have tools that enable us to get at such an infinity. So Gary, <laughs> if, if I could call on Gary, Gary has taken this basic idea as well as a few others that he and I work on and has uh, put it into a very nice formula, which I hope you guys would let him share very quickly. And I'm willing to make my formulas available to anybody who wants them. So uh, Gary, do you? want to put that up I think I think this yeah. is the most brilliant thing yeah I, I don't have I don't have the I don't have the share button so um and I'm not familiar enough with zoom to try oh. that so how about I like by the way this is some this is a real preliminary notion that I sketched out and I, have, I haven't spent a lot of time digging into further but uh yeah if Randy wants to put it up on his on the screen because I don't know that I can here uh it's I've never I've never tried maybe I can I've just never tried like the guy that, that flew as a 747. You know how to fly a plane? I've never tried. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, uh, right here. Uh, just a second. Wait, maybe I can get oh, here it is. I got a possibility it. here. <laughs> I have it. I have it. Okay. Uh, I thought Gary was going to share it, so I wasn't quite prepared. Hey, uh, I. Okay, here we go. I've got it up now. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, when Gary came over to my house with this, I just got so excited. Um, <laughs> um, keep in mind that it's, it uses mathematical symbols, but it's using them in more of a notional way than a genuinely formal sense. Um, also, that's an older version. There should be a bracket around... Uh, the XC portion as well. Uh, so basic basic meanings of terms, Gary, real quick, so that we don't um, have discussion. Using the idea of differential versus differentiate, uh, the, let's start with the primary, the X and the C. X would be an individual, whereas C would be, uh, a, for something, an example like the cosmic epoch. And, the diff and, it, and it's identifying, it's, well, let me, I can repeat pull up. Oh God, it went full view on me again. I can't read anything. Um, hang on. I'm sorry. I can actually better better off trying to read this and trying to uh, remember it. Oh. Raise some, yeah. Um, Limits of Zoom. Yeah. I, I wish uh, we were in a classroom together. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, let me just read this. The, um, the XC bundle, the small X represents the individual particular specific item or object. The language here needs to be worked out, but for now I'll continue to say individual. The large C represents the cosmos or cosmic epoch, the overreaching 
system of order. Thus, the individual is always modulo the system of order. The primary differential, the delta, operates on both of these together. Thus, the delta uh, J portion indexes over the XJ the individual, where the delta Q indexes over the CQ, uh, the cosmic order. This is a little, it's, I'm borrowing notions from a uh, tensor uh, analysis from differential geometry here. But it's not, but these are not indices per se, for example, that the end of the, end of the J and the Q might themselves be extremely highly complicated uh, structures in their own right and not merely, uh, and not merely, in, and so they're not numbers, they're simply indicating paths of connectedness. Those they're are not, my zeros. Those are my zeros above the line, the ones on the top line. Those are my zeros. It's maximal information. Um, and, quant and quantifying over the for all and there exists is that the idea is that of that here is that we're, one also needs to take into account how one speaks about a universal, how one speaks about an existential. So again, the representative, representative upside down A and backwards E are simply, um, are simply that representative of back. I, one has to make a, a difference between how one talks about uh, quantification across a universe of discourse. Um, and like I say, the, uh, there should be more para. I see that the, the, one, the image that, one, that, that Randy has there is actually an older one. I did a little better job on, on newer stuff, but I still don't have. In a good way of sharing it. Anyway, uh, go ahead. And go ahead, take, go ahead theory, take the theory of universes yeah, of discourse that is relevant to this is also in that logic book. Uh, yeah. Gary hasn't read it yet, but uh, I hope he'll like it when he does read it. <laughs> yeah, well, when it comes out on Kindle. <laughs> oh, you did? Oh, okay, no, no, when it, no, I'm saying when it comes out on Kindle, I can look into yeah. getting a copy. Well, I can always send it to you, Gary. But anyway, yeah, so, I'll, so, I'll actually, if you have, if you send, actually, if you send me the, uh, the in the in the doc in the word, MS Word form, then I can email it to myself and download it to my Kindle device. That okay, way. I'll do that. But we don't want to. Uh, so the point is yeah, that there is a take this off. It's, it's it's embarrassing me. And it's supposed to be about uh, it's supposed yeah. to be about Tim, not us. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. So 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 the point is is that there's an alternative to this kinder, gentler actualism, which involves a modeling of, uh, of possibility as determinate order. And that's gonna include what Michael meant by indeterminate order, because his, his indeterminate order from the standpoint of our theory is actually a determinate order that has been made indeterminate from an actual point of view. And, and, and it's all true. It's, a, it's, it's all true. It's a good way of theorizing without we are always in danger of, of misplaced concreteness, Gary and I, the way that we theorize, um, uh, because it's hard to find your way back to actuality if you're interested in a theory of pure possibility, right? But I think we can do it, so. Thank you, Randy and, and Gary. Um, Tim, if you wanted to, it seems like you wanted to jump in there and then I'll give Michael and uh, Elias a chance. Uh, I'll turn over to Michael or Elias, go ahead. You're muted, uh, Michael. Oh, there you okay, go. there we go. Okay. I you think after two years or whatever it's been of this uh, COVID and I, I literally, I've been Zooming for hours a week and now I've had a couple of weeks with no class and now I've forgotten everything. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to connect um, um, the, the, the last exchange between um, Randy and Gary to what, to what, what Elias was, was, was saying before and what I was saying before, um, because the way I, the way I, the reason I, I love Elias's approach um, uh, from the standpoint of of looking at quantum mechanics through the lens of Whitehead is that sort of and again trying to to avoid the the, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, which I am always trying to avoid myself. I think to myself, what's the bare minimum structure you need? in order to um, uh, look at quantum mechanics as an exemplification of what Whitehead had, uh, had proposed. And um, for, for what Elise was saying about the idea that, look, you can't do anything um, with, uh, with totally uncontextualized potentiality. You, you can't say anything meaningful, at least in terms of physics. So physicists who try to, for example, talk about the state of the universe prior to there being a universe, 
uh, like, like Lawrence Krauss, you know, trying to use quantum cosmology to, uh, you know, his argument is that, well, if quantum mechanics can describe the evolution of particles from quantum fields, maybe we can extend it further and describe the evolution of space-time itself from nothing, from just, again, pure potentiality. And of course, this doesn't work. You can't use quantum mechanics this way. Uh, and um, so what Elias, what, what, what he was saying about the idea that, look, you can't do anything unless you sort of um, uh, uh, acknowledge or you stipulate as a first principle of physics, let's say, that all local um, measurements in the universe, whatever your domain of discourse might be for, for some particular measurement interaction, you say globally, I don't know much about the universe other than um, every local measurement within it is going to involve some sort of Boolean contextualization. Meaning at the very minimum, you have to say that the principle of excluded middle holds locally for any local framework and the principle of, of non-contradiction holds locally. And um, so in other words, the observables have to commute within any local framework. And again, it has nothing to do with space or time like Aaliyah said, it's just about, you're saying, look, whatever the universe is, I'm gonna just stipulate so that I can talk about this sensibly, I'm gonna stipulate that locally propositional logic holds from which you can then construct an, an algebra of observables, for example. And that there's no global Boolean algebra in which you can embed all of these local contexts. So, and again, that's the, the Koch and Specker theorem. It's basically saying the whole is always gonna be more than the sum of its parts. So the global state is always gonna be more than the sum total of all the different possible local contexts. So you're just stipulating. You're saying, I just believe that, that locally, everywhere in the universe, propositional logic holds. Now, you can't prove it. It's just, some, it's just a, it's a desideratum of your, of your metaphysical, your speculative metaphysical scheme. So then the question becomes, well, is there any way, I mean, am I limited then? Is there any way in which I can um, uh, make a local measurement here and assume something might be true or assume that there is a, a, um, uh, some, uh, we call it an induction, but really it's more of an abduction. You say, you know, if, if my pen is here, I make a measurement, my pen is here. Can I say with equal certainty that it's not, you know, in a crater on uh, the moon? without actually going and measuring the state of the moon? The answer is yes, because of this, this stipulation that I just mentioned before, the first principles that must be true locally. So is there a way that I can um, represent this mathematically? And this is what Elias was talking about uh, with respect to um, using sheaf theory to essentially um, glue uh, whatever that you can determine via measurement locally here to some other context out there. And in fact, you assume by virtue of the fact that all local measurements satisfy these first principles uh, of logic from which you can construct local Boolean subalgebras for each, each potential measurement context out there. You can assume there's all, that, that, that there's three ways of relating all these local contexts. One, they're implicative. So what is true in one uh, guarantees the truth or falsity of some other uh, observable in the other frame like in an EPR experiment, spin up over here, guarantee spin down over there. Um, or they could be totally disjoint. So they have no, there's no way of, of bridging or gluing these algebras together. The, the contexts are completely um, uh, incapable of integration. So for Whitehead, they would be a multiplicity, for example. There, there's no way of integrating these things. Or, or three, which we would say is probably the most common, there's gonna be an overlap. So as long as you say locally, the structure holds, which again, I would say you can most, you can generalize it um, uh, most abstractly as just the satisfaction of non-contradiction and excluded middle. Um, 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 if every local measurement context satisfies these presuppositions, then there's gonna be a way of defining possible overlaps among all these different contexts. And so what you do is you don't deduce a global picture, you induce a global picture by virtue of the fact that you've stipulated these desiderata for every local measurement. And at least in quantum mechanics, this is, this is, you have to stipulate that. So it allows you, and, and, and of course, then the question becomes, well, how can I prove that there is some sort of overlap from which I can um, derive information about a global state locally? Um, 
And that's where the geometric phase or the topological phase comes into play because that, that's essentially a way of um, probing uh, global information that's not immediately accessible to you classically. So there's evidence that these that, that, that overlapping local measurement contexts are a way of inducing um, a global state in a, in, a, in a useful way. So the basic structure, and I think I, for, if what I understood about Gary's um, um, mathematical is logical representation of all this is that, yeah, the structure, the fundamental, again, the most abstract, ge most generalizable structure of potentiality um, that I can think of in physics is simply that, that locally, all measurement contexts are Boolean locally. And that globally, they're not Boolean, but they can be approximated or induced as overlaps among all these different local contexts. And that allows you to have coherent relations. Otherwise, a co coherent relations globally. Otherwise, the universe is partitioned into a chaotic jumble of different um, um, disjoint local contexts. And at least as far as physics is concerned, it doesn't seem to be that. I mean, I, I can't think of any example where the principle of non-contradiction or excluded middle have been disconfirmed in physics. Now, people claim that they do this all the time, macroscopic superpositions, the lab, but that's just an interpretive um, um, errors, if you ask me. Um, physics seems to uh, um, nicely exemplify the fact that, hey, you can have confidence. If my pen is here, it's not on Pluto. And uh, I, I don't need to waste lots of money and time going to measure every place where the, where the pen might be in the universe if I actually measure it here. And what gives me the ability to do that, to say that with confidence, is that I presuppose that all the local measurement contexts are in fact Boolean. So propositional logic always holds locally, although not globally in the same way. Um, I, I'm, I'm remembering what you said, uh, Randy. Uh, it, it was a phrase, I should have written it down. You said that there's no difference between a thing being actually here and virtually everywhere else. I might have misunderstood what you meant by that, because what I'm saying is, if it's actually here, it's definitely nowhere else, at least in the framework of this particular measurement. Of course, the state of the universe is going to change after this yeah. actual yeah, actualization. That's, and that's how I understood you, uh, 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 Michael, as well. I have no problem with that view from within our cosmic epoch. I don't think that it covers all possibility, but I do think it covers all possibility in our cosmic epoch. And you notice yeah. that Gary's formula is modified. It's, it's, it's limited or conditioned by the theory of cosmic epochs. Uh, and of course, you're right to not be terribly concerned about other cosmic epochs. <laughs> and so, I mean, it's pretty hard to get at them, right? Um, uh, yeah. And so I think, I don't, I, I mean, I think it's more a matter of emphasis. Gary and I are working on a theory that should include your theory. Uh, and I think when, when your book came out, we both read it very closely and we agreed everything you and uh, Elias said, it's true as far as it goes. And the only question is whether there's any important gain in physics from considering a difference between pure potentials as you describe them and possibility as such. Why that is clear on the independence of possibility, and Tim agrees with this, we had a discussion before this meeting, uh, that, 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 that possibility has its own independent structure. So when I use, and Gary uses the word determinate order, what we're actually talking about is the order that possibility has, regardless of whether it's actual. And that includes possibilities that are never actual. Now, what you hmm. said says, well, we can't make anything of that. And what I say is, oh, I'm going to try. <laughs> See if I can... <laughs> If I can get at that without messing up, without becoming misplaced in my country. Well, we wish you the best in that trying. <laughs> and uh, do you have any comment on this discussion? Was that an invitation to yeah, an invitation. Uh, Elias? If you want to unmute Elias to share, there you go. Uh, yes, OK. Um, how can I respond? I'm, I'm trying to figure out uh, uh, your points, uh, Randall, and, uh, uh, to see how I can address this, uh, um, uh, these strings of uh, zeros and ones that you presented in your diagram. And uh, there is a very simple test case, and we can do it now to see, that, uh, to see how it works. If you if you are happy with it, 
So, uh, so let's imagine the, what we call the, the state space of a spin system. Okay, what is called the qubit. And uh, the, this has a, a topological structure, it's, it's a sphere. It's a very simple topological structure. And the question is the following. If I start writing these uh, uh, strings of uh, zero and ones, can I evaluate them independently of uh, the point on the sphere that I start from? No. <laughs> you no, have to exactly. have Yes, uh, exactly. That, that, that's the point uh, of localization. What we call uh, localization is addresses exactly this problem. Mm -hmm. But if you write these strings of uh, zeros and ones on a flat plane, for example, on a Euclidean space, uh, then you can evaluate it independently of where you position it. But if you write uh, it... No. On, uh, on every, the, on every okay. object, yeah, just to finish this, and then uh, if you write this, uh, these strings on any uh, space which has curvature, the evaluation will depend on what is called the initial state. So where do you start? So you sure. start, if, you start, if you start from the pole of the sphere, if you start from a point on the equator or from the south pole, the result of the evaluation will be different, for example. If I evaluate the string from a North Pole and I get one, so yes, from the uh, South Pole, I can have exactly the opposite behavior. So, so, the, so you need, so you need uh, these strings in order it. to be evaluated. That's my whole point, that you need I, localization. I, you, you cannot avoid having a topology on, uh, on, the, on, uh, on the states. I, I, I mean, so I, you're wrong. It can, it can be done. And it can not only be done logically, it can be done mathematically. So, so wherever we've got, so this is the, this line here, the t above the ingression line. These are the, these are the possibilities exemplified in, in, in anything actual. And you're right, you've got to start there. But take that either to be, and so here's your Boolean disjunction, Tim, take that either to be um, uh, uh, a fully closed character. Now, remember, this isn't real division of an actual entity. This is all this is all division only in analysis. So these ones and zeros are not actual division. Uh, these these are characters of of a, of a durational epoch. Here, what we have is uh, uh, is full exemplification, and whatever is left out is maximal information unexemplified. So that's what possibility is relative to this egress. Now I, I specify another character and I realize that it's definitely absent. If it's definitely absent, that doesn't mean that it's determinately non-existent. And so it's determinate positive existence uh, belongs to the constellations of possibility up here. So these are collections of possibility down here and these are constellations of unexemplified possibilities up here. Because they bear this relation of egress, which is no, which is basically they have to exit in order for ingression to hold in order for the possibilities to be exemplified in the actual. Since there is a structure to the egress and since that can be represented digitally in this case, what we have is a complex Boolean algebra here, which is in fact representative of the theory of extensive connection in part four of process and reality. Extensive connection happens in five modalities in, in, in part four. In my logic book, I add a sixth one because Suzanne Langer added a sixth one. She understood this stuff pretty well, in my opinion. So anyway, Elias, my answer to your question very briefly is you keep saying we can know nothing about this. I agree, we can't know anything about it without having some actual standpoint, but we can generalize by either, um, uh, and, and so here's, here's your sort of Boolean, uh, so this is Boolean addition down here. This is Boolean multiplication up here. And so what we learn is something about the structure of the overlap of possibility 
from, from a digital analysis of what isn't in the actual, but must be in the possible. Now that must is qualified by the cosmic epoch because we can't get a must outside of that. But recognizing that this isn't the only cosmic epoch, then we can assume that there are possibilities that exist which are not, uh, which are not included in Gary's C in his, in, in his equation. We can assume they exist. That's the stuff that we can't know about. And so when you talk about not being able to know it, the structure of possibility, as it is non-exemplified in this cosmic epoch, is within our reach. Oh, thank you, Randy. Oh, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, and then I want to make sure we well, open it up to the floor for everyone. Research project in progress. I wish you the best with it. Uh, but kind of, you know, it, it sort of goes beyond where I'm kind of working from. Uh, and I... Uh, and so to speak, uh, in, in my own effort, I basically by hypothesis uh, say that the, we have on the one hand this uh, order of actuality, by hypothesis a distinct order of potential, which includes the, this uh, real potential as you describe it, uh, and, uh, and, and the, you know, uh, and the uh, uh, so, so I distinguish these orders on the basis inspired by the basic logical difference. Uh, so I, by hypothesis, I would claim that, I mean, I'm claiming that it's not an actualism uh, by hypothesis. Uh, so, okay, yes, that's incomplete. We need to go beyond that. And I would say that Mike and Ilias and their work help go beyond it to a certain extent with their relational realist project. And you may yet go yet further to provide an articulation of the uh, pure reals, uh, but that's, so to speak, beyond my my current program, and I wish you the best with it. I, but I think the uh, I think Anderson Weeks in the Q in the uh, chat made a, sort of raise a question about uh, you know if if it's in the in, in say in re referencing the quantum physics and you keep referencing back to uh, particular cases how 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 are we uniquely identifying the fact of a uh, a logic of the possible that's separate. From, and I think that that's, it, it's from the basic logic that we recognize that there's a distinction of a Boolean and non-Boolean logic from the basic, it's a logical, it's a claim based on the logic, inspired by that logic, that there is a, uh, an order of uh, landscapes of potential, a, 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 uh, that are real possibilities uh, and even pure possibilities that are distinct from actuality. Uh, so, so it's a it's it's so it's a combination of direct measurement and the structure and uh, uh, the, the the nature of the theory that points to the fact that you need both of these, uh, uh, both the ways of making reference to the actual and the possible. Uh, so, so that's uh, and, and 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 how to do that in, in more detail uh, is a work in progress, both at the broader speculative philosophical frame that I have worked on and uh, next order nuances, including white eddy nuances that Randy and Gary are so well doing. That's it. Thanks, Tim. Um, so I wanna make sure we have time. We have about 16, 17 minutes left uh, to address some questions and comments from our uh, larger audience of participants here. Um, there are a number of comments in the chat already and a discussion that's been unfolding. And I wonder um, if, if Benjamin wants to chime in to address some or, or one of the issues that have been discussed in the chat. Do you wanna unmute Benjamin? Go for uh, it. Sure, I, <laughs> I'm not sure how much I can intelligently express anything right now. Um, I mean, most of anything that I would say would probably just be more questions to Oxier about uh, about the point on um, possibility, the ways that it's independent from actuality. I mean, I certainly agree that Whitehead does theorize eternal objects as, at least in a very important sense, independent from actuality. Uh, I'm not sure which specific ways that they could be independent or not, especially um, the comment in the chat, they. Uh, saying they have a subjective order of their own, um, that that was 
a, a comment. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I get what that would necessarily mean or not. That's uh, in the paper. That's in the paper that Matt will send out. I quote all the sections, the, the, the main section of Whitehead, where he talks about the subjective order that possibilities have independent of actuality. He definitely says it. What does subjective order mean in that sense? Subjective order for Whitehead is a principle of unity, not of experience. Remember, everything experience. But it's a, it's a, the question is whether or not there is some kind of a determinate order, which is always going to involve subjectivity uh, for Whitehead. But subjectivity doesn't always mean experience. So if you're asking whether, um, uh, whether po pure possibilities experience one another, I don't think that that's implied by anything Whitehead says. But subjective order means uh, a sort of irreducibility. Uh, um, uh, and so there's a, it's not, it's not a perspective, but it's exemplified by perspective in our cosmic epoch. He says he doesn't really know um, uh, what it would be in another cosmic epoch, but that he suspects that there would be a quantum order to any cosmic epoch. Uh, but it's pretty speculative as to what that order would be. But he explicitly says possibilities, qua possible, have subjective form. That he said they have subjective form. That's what he says. <laughs> I'll I'll have to reference the citations more. That's it's a big surprise to me because I I would think that subjective form as a category would apply to prehensions. Uh, well, so there's no reason to think that there's not pretension in other cosmic epochs. Um, uh, and so uh, it's between pages 39 and 45 in Process and Reality. You might want to reread re those sections. Uh, all right. <laughs> um, thanks, Benjamin. Yeah, lots of questions here that I think we won't be able to uh, resolve in, in 10 or 15 minutes. So, uh, you know, this is an ongoing conversation. Um, but I want to make sure we get as many people to uh, the possibility of chiming in here. Speaking of possibilities, um, Anderson Weeks, do you want to raise some of the questions you put in the chat? I I think that uh, Tim actually addressed it already in a generic way. Uh, Tim, weren't you answering my chat question there? I, yes, I attempted to, uh, perhaps yeah. incompletely. I think you did a great job. I just. Um, I wish I'd noted, I did have a lingering question after you spoke, but I forgot what it was already, so I yield time to whoever knows what the question is already. <laughs> okay, I appreciate Thank that. You. Um, very considerate of you. Let's go to John uh, Meyer. Uh, you had some comments about category theory versus set theory. Do you want to jump on and? Well, I, I, think, that'd be, I think that'd be nicely um, uh, covered in uh, Gary's follow-up. I, one question I did have, I, I think, for Michael is um, um, that it, it seems like what you're suggesting is that there's this undifferentiated nothingness on the one hand, and then local contexts that are well behaved in terms of uh, Boolean laws of non contradiction and the law of divided middle. And um, it seems to me that that's not where Whitehead really starts from. He starts from not unordered nothingness, but from what he calls the primordial nature of God. And the, the, key, the key part of primordial to me is, is the, he's put the word order in there, primordial. There's a, there is a, some kind of ordering there that is uh, that he recognizes as part of what he considers God to be or part of God's function. And that that then manifests in how we experience things. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious how uh, God ends up uh, manifesting in uh, these well-behaved uh, local Boolean contexts that you have, or, or where God might exist in, in that kind of a framework? Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's a great question. Um, I might have misspoke. I don't think I did. I don't think I'd, I would ever say undifferentiated nothingness. It's, it's actual. There's no vacuous actuality for, for Whitehead. There's, the universe is out there. There's, I, I, there is no nothingness, right? Um, but it is undifferentiated. It's the difference between um, actual occasions as a multiplicity, uh, to use Whitehead's term, versus an actual versus uh, 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 an ordered some. There, there's some structure, whether it's ordered as a society with various types of order. But um, at 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 best, or sorry, I guess at worst, um, I don't know. 
it would be a multiplicity, not nothingness. So there, there is no nothingness, at least in this framework. And again, for me, the issue in terms of grounding this, uh, at least for the purposes of the, the work that Elias and I did, grounding this in physics, physics has nothing to say about nothing. You know, um, so that that said, um, yeah, I mean, th th this analysis that, that, that we attempted in our work can easy, easily be extended into a, a philosophical theology. Um, uh, because for me per personally, um, if there is a, a, a fundamental uh, set of first principles in physics, and again, for, for, and I, I like the way Whitehead talks about first principles in his speculative uh, uh, metaphysical scheme, is that, um, hey, we, we, we have to be explicit about them when we stipulate them. We just have to say at the beginning, okay, here are my presuppositions. Um, one desiderata, well, there's three desiderata for, for his uh, first principles, but one of the great things about um, uh, first principles is that, or a hint that you have first principles, that you can't abstract them further, is that they presuppose one another, that, uh, that, that they're mutually implicative in some way, much like actuality and potentiality are mutually implicative. Um, so um, if for me, the first principles for physics are just non-contradiction excluded middle, uh, I don't know how you can get more abstract or general than, than those principles. You're right, the argument can be made, well, where do these principles come from? Um, and if you extend this analysis to philosophical theology, then you know you, you could go straight to um, if you feel like it in the way that Kant did actually in his in his treatise um, that well there must be an author there must be some authorship there must be some fundamental primordial extant that's responsible for the ordering structure that we can't seem to evade in 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 in, in the best of our physical theories or it just in experience more broadly. I've never experienced a violation of non-contradiction or excluded middle um, when it comes to actuals. Possibles, yes, but actuals, no. So um, cer certainly the, 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 the framework here, because it explicitly identifies first principles, obviously the question arises, well, why these first principles and not others? Um, I don't have an answer to that uh, other than just faith. You know, uh, but I can't say anything meaningful about it, at least in terms of physics, because without those first principles, I can't say anything meaningful at all, let alone meaningful, uh, sorry, I can't say anything meaningful scientifically at all about the universe without the presupposition of those first principles. Um, so um, I, I, I can't. What you're saying there, Michael, that uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a range of things that the science does address but they're also inevitably philosophical uh, propositions that go beyond that. Just as the real is more inclusive than simply the actual, it's the actual and the possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, when, when Lawrence Krauss was just viciously uh, critiqued by uh, David Albert for his universe from nothing uh, nonsense, one of the big arguments was, look, you're, you're saying the universe begins from nothing and you can demonstrate this quantum mechanically, but you're using quantum mechanics as a kind of engine that drives the creation of the universe ex nihilo. And so I guess you're at least stipulating that quantum mechanics existed. If the physical universe didn't exist, then primordially at least quantum mechanics exist. And what is quantum mechanics, but fundamentally a logical way of relating objects? Well, there's no physical objects to relate. So what are you relating? Right, there was never been some content to the real, even by his uh, proposition. So the yeah. claim of radical nothingness was a not it was wrong. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So if he's going to ontologize, um, so again, what what's related quantum mechanically? Krauss would say, well, concepts are related quantum mechanically. Well, he's ontologizing concepts then, which is fine with me. I think you should. Um, but right away, then he's, he's, he's admitting that there is some sort of primordial actuality. He doesn't want to call it God. He actually ends up calling it the multiverse ultimately, which to me, it's, you know, whatever. I mean, that's, it's, there's no difference. You're, you're, you're presupposing a primordial extant solely uh, on the basis that there, there is a structured realm of possibilities that you can point to in physics. And for me, the fundamental structure of those possibilities is Again, the, is, it can't abstract any farther than non-contradiction excluded middle locally, locally. Um, 
And, um, but, but, but to get back to John's question about, okay, well, how do I go from local to global without saying the global is undifferentiated nothingness? It's not nothing. It's just the question is how do I coordinate my local something with all of the other local somethings that relative to me are non-local, they're global. And um, uh, the, 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 the great thing about quantum mechanics and particularly the, the geometric phase phenomenon, which is, you know, no one debates this phenomenon exists. There is a way of saying something meaningful globally about a global state that's not accessible directly. Um, it's, it's, it, and we don't have an explanation for it. Whitehead, it would be, to put in Whiteheadian language, there is a physical exemplification of the, of the concept of hybrid physical prehensions. We see hybrid physical prehensions in physics all the time. I guess even with just EPR, you see it, but, but, um, but you see it even more broadly, more generally in this, in this, in this, uh, this, uh, this phenomenon of the global geometric phase. And um, so there is something out there. The question is how much can I coordinate it with my local experiences of what's here? And, and, and conversely, how do I, how is it that I can say what happens locally here matters out there? Because it's bi-directional, you know, that what's possible locally is restricted by what's actual globally. But conversely, what is actualized locally has its uh, conditioning influence on possibilities that are global. And that can all be, what Elias does, I'd say masterfully, in, in, in our book together is he, he mathematizes this. He shows how this can be um, um, formalized mathematically, not reduced to mathematics, but, but formalized mathematically so that it can be um, uh, used as a way for perhaps trying to formalize something like the global geometric phase in physics. Yeah, yeah. Thank, so thank that was a very long-winded uh, answer. So sorry. Yeah, thank, you, thank you, Michael. Is there any other question you want to, to uh, get from the audience there, uh, Matt? Can I make a, 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 an observation about Michael's answer? I'll make it very fast. Sure, go ahead, Randy. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, I've got a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, uh, basically, oh. I, I, everything Michael said, and I'm glad that he uses the, the, the problematizes what he's talking about by saying, how do I coordinate? Because in fact, that's how Whitehead goes at problems like that. He, he hypothesizes some kind of a coordinate hole. Um, uh, and the coordinate hole he hypothesizes in process of reality, and so for the sake of cosmology, is the cosmic epoch. But there is no reason to infer that the structure of this cosmic epoch is necessarily the structure of any other. And furthermore, finding the limits of this cosmic epoch is a serious problem. And I take that to be what Michael is about. But what, is, what are the limits about what I should care about here? Because our physics is, is actually a physics of the immediate epoch, not just of the cosmic epoch. But the cosmic epoch would be kind of the, the furthest we would want as physicists to be concerned with, because there's no reason to assume that other cosmic epochs are physical reality in the sense that we understand it. But Whitehead is very clear that other cosmic epochs probably do and in fact probably must exist. And the one thing that he says is probably going to be true of any cosmic epoch is that there will be a quantum. And, and Gary and I interpret that as a quantum explanation. So the one thing you could carry across the theory of cosmic epochs would be some kind of quantum of explanation. It wouldn't necessarily be the actual entity, which is the quantum of explanation of this cosmic epoch. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Randy. I think we have a couple of minutes left, and I'm just trying to see if there's a question that could be managed in that time frame. Um, is Clinton, Clinton Combs still with us? I'm not sure. No, I think he had to drop he out. He left. Okay. Um, Farzad, are you there? Is, do you want to share what you were asking in the chat briefly, if possible? Uh, briefly, if possible. Boy, that's a problem <laughs> I'm not sure we've dealt with today, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I guess my, my key question was about that sort of, I'll put it in metaphorical terms, the condensation of. Um, possibilities into real potentials, that sort of transformation. Um, that seems to be really crucial here. And so I was really interested uh, when Elias was talking about the uh, uh, developing surfaces, uh, sort of putting conditions and constraints on possibilities um, 
uh, in order to minimize, for example, minimize the number of Boolean phrases to do something that kind of creates a, a neighborhood of overlap. Uh, something like that was what I was getting. And then I kind of lost it at, uh, but then you're trying to maximize something else. And uh, so between those two, I thought there's a lot of work that gets done on pure possibility without actually, and, but on the way toward um, actualization. Um, and, and that's what I was, I was wondering whether I got that right or I, I, I know I missed the maximization part, but anything you could do to elaborate that would be wonderful. Elias, go ahead. Yeah, of course, I can go ahead, but I just saw Ravi that he said that this was part of what he was saying. So maybe he wants to talk first. I don't know. Uh, okay, I can make a, a small uh, a comment that uh, this notion of a Boolean frame, uh, of course, it does not apply uh, globally. That's the whole idea. But uh, in relation, for example, to uh, how we make uh, measurement in quantum mechanics, for example, the experimental procedure, uh, all the observables are evaluated with respect to Boolean frames, which are basically uh, true-false propositions corresponding to what's called projection operator. So uh, the idea is that this is the only way that you can have uh, access to, uh, to the space of quantum states about which you cannot, you do not have any a priori means to distinguish. Okay, now the issue is, that's the first issue. The second is that in relation to quantum mechanics, you cannot evaluate everything simultaneously. So you have this problem of uh, complementarity. Okay, which actually you, you even have uh, in, um, in the theory of waves also in classical physics. For example, when you have, uh, when you want to evaluate time and frequency simultaneously, this is not possible. So this is what's called the uncertainty uh, principle. Now you need to find a, a way to, to make a kind of gluing together of all these uh, Boolean frames. That's the only way to go from the local level to what we call the global level. Okay, this is what I said before, this is called uh, a shift. So the shift has the, somehow the, uh, the global information uh, which is generated out of uh, this kind of uh, gluing of all these local Boolean uh, frames. And the final point is that um, uh, the, the unique, the special uh, aspect of this shift is that it is characterized uh, by phases. This is uh, the notion of a geometric phase. It's, it's a kind of invariant, which is not reducible to the local Boolean context. So it's a global, non-reducible thing. And this is exactly, now uh, what we have showed is that this is exactly responsible for the phenomena of interference and entanglement. Okay, all this non-classical type of uh, uh, behavior. So this is uh, uh, how it works. And you can apply it, for example, in the case of a qubit, uh, a two-state quantum system. And just to reconnect uh, with uh, the comment of, uh, of Randall before, but uh, definitely what I said is not wrong. And, uh, this was, uh, this is the famous Gleason's theorem but I mentioned with the example of the sphere, but you cannot evaluate any of these strings of zeros and ones simultaneously, independently of where you start on the sphere. So there is a global coherence relations in the spheres which are in, on the sphere, which are not reduced on, uh, uh, on any local paths that you can put on the sphere in order to write uh, these uh, strings. Now, if you want to, to, to introduce uh, hidden variables, which will play the role of a cosmic epoch, or uh, I think the cosmic epoch is modeled uh, more probably with the notion of a geometric phase, 
and not with any kind of uh, hidden variable uh, uh, model. Uh, what we know is that uh, uh, all uh, local hidden variable mo models uh, are not uh, valid. So there is a there is a theorem. You can deduce it even from uh, what's called the cohen specker theorem. Uh, so uh, this was an old attempt starting um, uh, with uh, BOM, but from a totally different perspective, from a global perspective. But people uh, had the hope that they can make uh, this kind of local hidden variable uh, models. And uh, uh, now we know uh, definitely that these models do not work. Uh, what works and what is what is experimentally observable, for example, it works in solid state physics. All these new uh, devices that uh, that we use is this notion of uh, a global geometric phase. Okay, this is responsible for uh, mm -hmm. this kind of entanglement, independently of things. If things in space are near to each other, or they are in different parts of the of the universe. So this is. Uh... Thank you, Elias. So I think I'm going to need to draw a definite end to this particular occasion. And we're only just getting started. We're on like the first 60 pages of Tim's book. And so the conversation will certainly continue. Uh, it was pretty high level today. There's lots uh, for me to reflect on. We're going to share the chat. We're going to share uh, Randy's paper. Uh, with the group that was present today via email. And uh, the next session, the third on chapter three, will be on August the uh, 14th, Saturday, August 14th, 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern time. I hope you can all join us so that we can uh, continue this dialogue. Much remains to be discussed clearly. So thank you all for your participation. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you for the questions. Thank you to all. Until we meet again.